Good to see everyone. Trust you're doing well. Grab your hymnal if you're able to stand. Stand and join us. Uh, 462, yield not to temptation. 462, let's stand and sing this together this morning. Yield not to temptation, for yielding is sin. Each victory will help you, some others to win. Fight manfully onward, dark passion subdued. Look ever to Jesus, he will carry you through. Ask the Savior to help you. Come for strength and keep you. He is willing to aid you. He will carry you through. Shun evil companions, bad language disdain. God's name hold in reverence, nor take it in vain. Be thoughtful and earnest, kind-hearted and true. To Jesus, He will carry you through. Ask the Savior to help you, comfort, strengthen, and keep you. He is willing to aid you. He will carry you through. Turn and shake hands with your neighbors this morning. the third to him that overcometh God giveth the crown through faith we shall conquer though often cast down he who is our Savior our strength will renew look ever to Jesus he will carry you through the Savior to help you, comfort, strengthen, and keep you. He is willing to aid you. He will carry you through. Did you read the words of that song as you sang it this morning? Let's look at it once again. Yield not to temptation, for yielding is sin. Every victory will help you, some other to win. Fight manfully onward, dark passions subdue. Look ever to Jesus, he will carry you through. Shun evil companions, bad language disdain. God's name hold in reverence, nor take it in vain. Be thoughtful and earnest, kind-hearted and true. Uh, look ever to Jesus, he will carry you through. To him that overcometh, God giveth the crown. Uh, through faith we shall conquer, though often cast down. He who is our Savior, our strength will renew. Look ever to Jesus, he will carry you through. Amen? Amen. We need to learn to apply these things to our life on a daily basis, all right? It'll help us to live victorious. Uh, I love that second verse there uh, where it says, uh, if I can find it, 
Uh, maybe it's the first verse. Uh, oh, yes, first verse. Each victory will help you some other to win. Every time we trust the Lord to give us victory, it helps us get victory uh, next time. Amen? Good to have you here this morning. Good to see each of you. Do be in prayer, Brother Bill. Patrick I was in the hospital a couple days this week. He's back in a rehab facility up in uh, Chandler now. Uh, BJ and Frank had to fly out uh, Thursday around noon. Their son, Frankie, Thursday morning had a massive heart attack, 42 years old. He's doing amazingly better, though. They was able to, uh, his main artery was completely clogged, but they was able to uh, put some stents in and get the blood restored uh, quickly enough to where I don't know how much damage was done, if she's seen anything about that, but nevertheless, he's doing amazing. Uh, so be in prayer for him. They're planning on flying back on Wednesday. And then we got some others. I uh, got some news from uh, there from the Kentucky where we've been praying there for Brother Bush. Uh, he's really making progress. Keep praying. He, he was at church last Sunday morning and evening, and God's done amazing things. So continue to pray for uh, Dr. Bush there, uh, there in Kentucky. And then pray for one another. We got several of our folks away from us. Some... Uh, Maybe got rained out this morning. I don't know, but we're glad you're here. And uh, thank the Lord for your being here. Uh, don't, don't forget, uh, no men's Bible study on Tuesday night. And Wednesday night, we'll be taking our church over to Brother Jay Shannon. So if you want to ride the bus with us, we'll leave here at 630. And, uh, but if you would like to drive, of course, you can. If you need directions, let us know. But the bus will be leaving here at 630 if you want to go with us. Brother David Jones starting a meeting for them today. And it'll be run through Wednesday. So we want to go and support their meeting and take our church over on Wednesday night. Okay? Now let's pray together. Lord, we come to you at this time. We thank you for the day you've given us the opportunity to be here once again. Thank you for the country we live in, the freedoms that we have, and the privileges that we enjoy. We ask you, now, Lord, this day to be with us and guide us. Uh, some of our folks are missing, Lord. We don't know exactly where they are, but, Lord, we know that uh, you know. So, Lord, I pray that you touch them, help, help them, and heal them. And, Lord, for those that are here, I pray that you speak to us and guide us and give us, uh, Lord, exactly what you would have, it to ha have us to have from your word. I pray, Lord, for every family. We, yesterday, those that was able to come out, and, Lord, for those that, that are in the hospital, Lord, recovering, or those there uh, in rehab center, Lord, wherever they are, I pray that you give them strength. And, Lord, for this day, we give you all the praise. Be with us now and guide us. We thank you for our missionaries that we're able to participate and partner with. Uh, Lord, I pray that you give them fruit for their labor, for our military, give them safety. And, Lord, for those that lead our nation, Lord, give them instruction and wisdom. Uh, give them uh, guidance, Lord, that they may follow you. And help us, Lord, this morning as a song we just sang. And learn to follow you and trust you and yield not the temptation that this world may throw at us. We thank you for this day. Be with us and guide us in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated, but keep your hymnal. Turn over to number five, one of my favorite songs, number five. Holy, holy, holy. I just said be seated, but it's your calisthenics exercise day, so stand uh, to your feet. Holy, holy, holy this morning. As we always want to stand, we sing this song, all right? Let's all stand once again. Stand this song if you're able. We always want to stand if we're able when we sing this song. Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall rise to Thee. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. Holy, 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 all the saints adore Thee, casting down their
seated. Come on forward, gentlemen, if you would. We thank you so much for being here. I share with the Sunday School this morning. Welcome to the 10th month of the year. And uh, it's the first Sunday, the 10th month, 85 days till Christmas. Isn't that exciting? And uh, have you already been in a store that's already decorated for Christmas? Yeah, me too. And uh, so they've already got their lights up and more decorations going up. Do be in prayer for one another. We got a bunch of birthdays this month and a couple of anniversaries. We got uh, Miss Verna had one this past week. David and Cheryl have one this coming week. And Aaron, Joyce, Terry, Joyce, and Heather have them later in the month. And then a couple of anniversaries, Tom and Joan's anniversary were the, was the very first day of the month. And then Ralph and Michelle's is later towards the end of the month. And uh, so let's be in prayer for all these that's going on. Don't forget about uh, Wednesday night. If you want to go with us over to Brother Jay Shannon's, we will not be having services here. We're going to go and support their meeting. It's only about 15 minutes away. We'll be leaving here at 630 and if you want to drive, of course, you need directions out of snow. If you want to ride with us, we're leaving here at 6.30 uh, on Wednesday night. The note in your bulletin there of that. And then also, no men's Bible study on Tuesday. Uh, keep up with these, these events. Be in prayer for one another and what's going on. We'll ask the Lord to bless us and throughout the day. Uh, how many of you were able to have your picture made yesterday? Great. Wonderful. I was sharing with somebody this morning, one of the best parts about giving a picture made is cameras don't lie. That's one of the that's one of the blessings of a, uh, right, amen. And uh, so, uh, uh, but now I'm thankful you're able to come out and do that, and and uh, we'll have a great time putting our director together here in a few weeks, and and they'll be mailing some things out to you. So keep up with that if you want to do some other things. These uh, these options are always available there. They have, uh, I think, six months. They archive those. I mean, they uh, keep those active for six months. If you want to change the order, adding additional pictures or whatever, and they archive them after that. So. We are thankful you were able to come out. If you wasn't, you need to see us so we can maybe get some things made and accomplished and, and adjusted there whenever one that we can to have in the bulletin. Amen? Now, we are glad you're here today, or the bulletin, the uh, directory. So thank the Lord for those around me. All right, and uh, uh, thank you for being here. Ron, if we'd ask for the blessing upon the offering. Three hundred and seventy-eight this morning in your hymnal. It is well with my soul. Three hundred seventy-eight, and let's sing this together and sing it out as unto the Lord. Amen.
This morning, is our junior church already out? Are they already out? Oh, junior church, you can follow Miss Heather out if you would this morning. I appreciate that. And Eric, if you wouldn't mind, grab that microphone off my desk if you come by there. And uh, I just uh, forgot to grab it this morning. Uh, if you have your Bible this morning, turning over to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3. Be in prayer for our young people, uh, nursery and junior church alike, at their next door. And we're thankful for what the Lord's doing and what He has done. And we want to ask Him to do more. Amen. I do be in prayer for uh, Brother Bill. We mentioned he was uh, back in a rehab facility. He had a pretty rough day. Uh, pretty rough. He's been getting a little bit weaker every uh, p- for the past week or two, but uh, was uh, had to be hospitalized for a couple of days. But Friday evening, I think it was, maybe Thursday evening, I can't remember, but he uh, had to be transported back up to a rehab facility. And it seems to be doing good, uh, but be in prayer for Brother Bill. He is just like the rest of us. He would like to be home. And uh, so let's be in prayer for him. And we mentioned BJ uh, and Frank there in Casper, Wyoming. Uh, they flying back out of Denver again, be driving down to Denver on Wednesday and then flying back this way. Uh, so be in prayer for them. Their son, Frankie, uh, 42 years old, had a massive heart attack. So be in prayer for uh, Frankie and them as they travel as well. And the whole family actually is supposed to have a trip to Japan next month, actually, month, November, right? Or China next month, right? And uh, so uh, Frankie included. Uh, this is a big trip we've had planned for some time, uh, so pray for uh, all of that. There's a lot of decisions that need to be made. Of course, crucial uh, right now is Frankie's health, so be in prayer for uh, that and those others of our church that are traveling. 
election genie with the, uh, they've had someone look at their house this week, uh, I don't, at least one I know of, and uh, they were hoping to sell their house here pretty quickly. And you be in prayer for them as they try to finalize some things in preparation to move up to Washington. And then Bobby Goins and his family are supposed to be in town sometime later this week, so be in prayer for them as they're moving to this area uh, to start a Spanish church. Uh, so you be in prayer for them, and the Lord would bless them and their traveling and also the ministry that lies ahead. Amen? Matthew chapter 3 this morning. Uh, uh, we're going to read a couple of texts, and then we'll talk about some things. We pick up our text here. Uh, God has told Mary that she's going to have a baby, all right? Uh, her and Joseph are, uh, if you will, engaged or betrothed to one another. Uh, there's a promise of marriage to come. Uh, when the Lord uh, conceives in her the Holy Ghost, Christ. Uh, therefore, Mary now, being a virgin, uh, never been with a man, we, that's another lesson for another day, but uh, is now expecting a child. She uh, tells her uh, Fiance, I will call him, uh, Joseph, uh, that she's going to have a baby. But it's, it's not from other man. It's, it's, it's of the Lord. It's, it's the Christ child. Of course, he would be just like the rest of us. Uh, that would be hard to believe because that's never been done and hasn't been done since, you know. Uh, this was not some scientific creation. This was the Lord Almighty through the Holy Ghost con- uh, bring, brought uh, into conception here so, so Christ could be born so he could die for our sins. But nevertheless, Joseph there, the Lord, the angel comes back to Joseph and reassures him uh, that it's okay, go ahead and marry her, and he does. He does not touch her, does not consummate the marriage, we'll say, until uh, after the child is born. But nevertheless, they are husband and wife, and uh, the Christ child is born. After the Christ is born, uh, the, the shepherds see uh, the star, uh, see the star, they follow the star there to the Christ child, uh, they bow and worship him. After they depart, then... There, as the child is growing up, maybe a couple years old, we don't know how old, but as the child is growing, there's some wise men that now hear of him, and they want to go and worship him. Herod, of course, uh, being the king there, wants to have the child put to death. He doesn't want any competition for the throne. Uh, so therefore, he has these wise men come by, and he says, let me give you some help, anything you need for the trip. He tries to show himself friendly, and therefore, when you find out where he is, come and tell me where he is so I may go and worship also. He that was not his motives. His motives were to find out where he was so he could kill the Christ child. And therefore, it was revealed through a dream to the wise men what is happening. So while they're there, when they depart from there, they're told of a dream not to go back. And therefore, they depart and don't go back that way. Uh, now we go forward, and, and time is moving forward. And now Mary and Joseph, has, Herod has died. Chapter 2, Matthew, Herod has died. Now they're told it's okay for you to return. Uh, so because those that seek your life is dead... And in return, they're on their way. And the end of chapter 2 says this, And he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. And in chapter 3, verse 1, In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this was he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The, lo- the voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, that his- make his path straight. And the same... John uh, had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins, and he, his meat was locust and wild honey. Uh, then came out of him uh, Jerusalem and to all Judea and all the region round about Jordan, and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, uh, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits, meat for repentance." And think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now uh, also uh, the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. And he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Uh, this is a story, if we will, we're introduced to John the Baptist here. Isaiah spoke of the coming prophet of John and uh, spoke of the coming prophet that would go before Christ, and here John is declaring, uh, or Christ is declaring for us through the book of writings of Matthew here uh, about the ministry of John. If you turn over to the book of John, John chapter 1 real quickly, 
I would replace them. Matthew will be going right back there in just a moment. But in John chapter 1, uh, we're introduced to John in a more, little more detail, if you will, of his own testimony. In John chapter 1, and we have here, he says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of, that, of the light, uh, that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Uh, he was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born uh, not of blood, nor the will of flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory is the only begotten of His Father, full of grace and truth. So we have the testimony of John himself saying, I am not that light. I am not the Savior. He says, I just came to bear witness to the light. I am the one that God sent to, to preach repentance. I am the one that, that, that started preaching repentance and be saved before he, His ministry was made public. So therefore, we have now the introduction in Matthew chapter 3 of John and his ministry. In, in those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Now let me say something real quickly. We are not Baptist because his last name was Baptist. His last name was not Baptist. We don't know his last name. But he was John the Baptist. That idea being there, the, the doctrine of baptism is very, uh, very important. Uh, it's often o overlooked and, and often even minimalized, especially in a Baptist church. And inter interesting, we, wear, we carry the name Baptist, but we minimalize often baptism. And the reason is because some have perverted the use of baptism. Some would say that baptism saves you. It's a part of your salvation. It completes your salvation or whatever. Baptism has nothing to do with your salvation. Uh, but, but because some preach that and teach those teachings, and a lot of people believe that, uh, they, and people reuse it and misuse it, uh, it causes us sometimes to be a little apprehensive on how we use it. Let's just use it scripturally. How's that? Next week, Denise is going to follow Lord and Believer's baptism. If everything, everything works out, that's the plan, right? And she's going to, last week she trusted Christ for Savior, and next week she's going to make it public. She came forward last week and stood in front of the church and made it public in that regard of her testimony, but next week she'll make it public by her testimony of baptism, therefore symbolizing the death, burial, and resurrection that she trusted Christ her Savior, that his death, burial, and resurrection was the sacrifice for her sin, the payment for her sin in full. And therefore, as a result of that, now she wants to follow the Lord in believer's baptism, showing publicly that she's trusting him by faith for her Savior until he comes again. That's what baptism is. That's a wonderful thing. We need to, we need to make a big deal about it, and we try to, and I appreciate those that help with that. But the reality of it is, baptism doesn't save you. Uh, there are denominations that are started, that were started by, by, by people, that maybe some of them came out of the Protestant Reformation, and therefore their name, because of the preaching that they did, a denomination sprung up bearing their name. There are Calvinists that follow after the teachings of John Calvin. There are Wesleyans, which would be uh, I'm a, kind of a pre-runner pre and, and, and a a different variety of Methodists which come after the teaching of John Wesley. You say, well, what's wrong with those men? They were great men. I'm thankful they protested the Catholic Church and came out of that. But we are not Baptists because of John's name. We are Baptists because of the doctrine of baptism. The doctrine of baptism is so important, I'm going to tell you what it is. Uh, and if you ever read anything about church history, and I would encourage you to do so. It's an amazing subject matter to read about, an amazing subject matter. Baptism is, such, is so important that there, are, there have been hundreds, if not thousands of people who give their life for the doctrine of baptism. Say, so wait a minute, that's not salvation, you said. I know, why would they give their life? Because it's important so that we don't mislead what salvation is. Back in the early days, in, in, in the first century church, and a little bit after that, uh, this, there was Rome, the church at Rome, the Roman Catholic Church, and then there were the Apostles' Doctrine, and then there was really a few little miscellaneous teachings of Baal and some things like that. But the reality of it is, there wasn't that many denominations, if you want to use that term. All right? So when the disciples was started, Christ used the disciples to start the church, and they went out preaching, teaching Christ and salvation 
by, by grace through faith. And as a result, it stirred up the Orthodox Jews. It stirred up Rome. It stirred up a lot of the teachings of a lot of that was taking place because it was different. It was going against the tradition of church, tradition of religion. So as a result, people got angry about that. The Roman Catholic Church became one of the angriest groups of people. And by that I mean this. The Roman Catholic Church are, are, is one of the, uh, I don't like to use that word religions, but we'll just use that, okay? Uh, just help, bear with me. That will baptize infants. How many of you understand what I mean by that? They will take a baby when it is born and they will christen or they will baptize. They will have a baptismal service for an infant. Now, here's the problem with that. That child will grow up with a false sense of salvation. That baptism that they performed had nothing to do with salvation for that child. Nothing. Remember when David, when his, the baby that him and Bathsheba had had through an adulterous relationship, and the baby was born and it became very sick? Remember that account there in the Old Testament? It became very sick, and, and David was a king, and David kind of broke himself loose from, from his role of being a king and, 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 and covered himself in ashes and sackcloth and, and was mourning and praying and fasting so vehemently that, that the people were afraid to approach him because of his, the seriousness of his prayer for his child to be healed. But remember when, they, when the news, when, when he seen the, the men talking and, and someone said, and I'm going to paraphrase, but they said, you go tell him, no, you go tell him, no, you go tell him, you know, that his child's dead. Remember that? And, and, and they said, we're not going to tell him because they, they realized how severely he was hurting because the child was sick. They said, there's no telling how he'll react once he finds out the child is dead. He sees them talking amongst themselves. And he perceives, the Bible says in his mind, that, it, that the, heart, the child was dead. So here's what happens. As a result, he asked them, is the child dead? And they said, yes. He gets up, bathes himself, shaves, puts on his clothes, and goes back to his throne to being king of Israel. And they said, we don't understand. They had come to later. They said, we don't understand. While the child was alive and sick, you, you, were, you were so broken in prayer and fasting, and, and, and now the child is dead. And, and how is it that you go on? He says, listen. Catch this real quickly. This is important. He says, the child cannot come to where I am, but I can go where the child is. Catch this real quickly. That child was not baptized. That child wasn't sprinkled or christened. The Bible teaches very clearly that there's a grace that God gives us until there comes a time of accountability where we recognize right and wrong and consequences for wrong. There's a, that we are covered by grace as a child. But the moment that a child or an individual comes to the place, it's not an age. It's not 9 or 10 or 12 years old as some people teach. It's not an age. It's a time of accountability. And it changes for every individual. When you become accountable, where you recognize that we're a sinner and there's consequences of sin, the consequences of sin is hell. When you recognize that because of my sin, I can go to hell, the Holy Spirit can convict your heart and recognize you need to be saved until you're recognized Listen, catch this real quickly. Until we recognize our need of salvation, we cannot receive Him as our Savior. But up until that moment in time, we're covered by grace. But once we become accountable, we we're, we're now make a choice. One of the things that an interesting teaching of the Word of God is powerful. God will never exercise His will above ours. He gives us a free will. The New Testament and Old Testament light bears that out. He will not make us do anything. He won't make us be saved. There are some that teach that He makes some be saved. Therefore, they are the appointed. They are the elect. And therefore, as a result of that, they have to be saved. Nothing they can do about it. That's ridiculous. For God so loved the world, He gave His life. He gave His Son to the, 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 whomsoever, right? Whosoever believeth. The Bible says that, that in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, that when we were, but while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 13, over in many other places, it talks about that anybody that believeth, anyone and whomsoever believeth, shall be saved. The Bible over and over again declares that it's not, a, it's not a certain group of people, it's not a certain number of people, it's whosoever will. When he went to Calvary, he bled, the Bible says he bled and died there. He shed his blood so that all could be saved. Subtract any from all, and it's not all. Think about that. And then there are others that believe that you have to become accountable at a certain age until you're 12 years old, that you don't need to be worried about be, being saved because until you're 12, you're automatically saved. That's just as ridiculous. Some are 
or, or can receive Christ at a younger age than others because of maybe the way they were raised or their ability to, to accept and, and withhold information. Some were raised in church and exposed to the earlier age, and some maybe didn't, didn't hear the gospel until they were an adult. But the reality is simply this. It's not an age. It's a time. There are those that believe that baptismal water saves you, and therefore, that you, if, you, if you just get your heart right and you want to do better, then if you get baptized, then that saves you. That's just as ridiculous. None of these are found in the Scripture. Baptism's important. Baptism of, that, of those first century churches was going forward, and Rome got very upset because all of a sudden there were people being saved through the preaching of the, the gospel, and they were being rebaptized people that was baptized an infant that was now part of the Roman Catholic Church, the church of Christ, not the denomination, but the church that Christ started through the disciples was preaching the gospel. Disciples were preaching and people were preaching and testifying of Christ and people were being saved and now they were followed in believers' baptism. The New Testament bears out, by the way, the New Testament, every single person that trusted Christ, we have an account of their baptism except for the thief on the cross. Think about that. And here's the thing about it. The thief on the cross is a testament that you don't have to be baptized to be saved. The rest of them give an account of their baptism because it's obedience. Remember the eunuch there in Acts chapter 8? He says, what does hinder me from being baptized? He says, Philip says, because you haven't believed. He says, thou believest, thou mayest. You catch that real quickly? Baptism is not believing. Believing brings forth the privilege of baptism. So the Roman Catholic Church was getting upset because now these people that were baptized in the Roman Catholic Church were now being rebaptized because the Baptist Church, if you only use that term, and I'll give you some terms in a minute, but that new century church, this new, this first century church, this church of, of Christ that started through the disciples, this church, this New Testament church, wasn't accepting that baptism. And what a slap in the face to the leaders of the Roman Catholic Church. Our baptism is not good enough for you. And I got upset about it. Because the New Testament church now was baptizing them by immersion. And it wasn't accepting a sprinkling. And it wasn't accepting an infant baptism. They got upset about it. So they started calling them things like Anabaptist. A-N-A-B-A-P-T-I-S-T. That means rebaptizer. It wasn't meant to comment them, c c commend them. It was meant to slander them. To, it was meant to be hurtful to their name. Oh, you're, you're one of those rebaptized. Later on, they even called them drowners. I'll tell you how severe it was. They took their lives because if a person said they wanted to be baptized again, they would kill them if they found out about that many times. They took those Christians sometimes out on a boat and they would chain them together. There's accounts of this. This is not made up stories. These are real historical accounts. They took and chained them together, one to another, to another, to another, and chained a bunch of them together, sometimes maybe a hundred at a time. And they would, at the end of the chain, they would put a big old weight. And they'd take them out in the middle of the sea and they would push that weight off. And, they, and before they push the weight off, they'd say, because you drown others, now you're going to lead, because you lead others into drowning, they called it drowning, baptism by immersion, because you lead others in drowning, now you're going to lead one another into drowning. And they would push the weight off the side of the boat, and the weight would pull the first person in, which was chained to the second person, to the third person, and so forth and so on. And they would lose their life over the doctrine of baptism. Listen, all that being said this morning, we are not Baptists because of John being called the Baptist. We are Baptists because of the doctrine of baptism. Because baptism doesn't save you, nor does baptism keep you saved. It has no part in your salvation. It is only a testimony that you have trusted Christ by grace through faith as your personal Savior. It's a public testimony. Baptism has to be done publicly so that the public can, you can have a testimony publicly of your identification with Christ and the doctrine of salvation by grace through faith. Now that being said, look at John chapter, or Matthew chapter 3. Look at John, or the ministry of John. John now, here we find him being introduced as a man from the wilderness. I mean, I mean, this guy is not like, they don't have him walking the red carpet. I mean, look at him. We're introduced to him here. The Bible says, uh, verse 3, For this was he that was spoken of, the prophet Isaiah, saying, The Lord of the, 
uh, the voice of the prophet, uh, uh, the voice of the crying of the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make, path, make his path straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair. His clothes were made of camel's hair. Did you see that? He wore a leather girdle about his loins, and his meat was locust and wild honey. His diet was locust and wild honey. Uh, some of our church have got together recently, and they said, you know what, we're going to try to uh, fix, repair some of our broken diet. It's probably a good thing, in all honesty. Anybody want to follow this diet? Locust and wild honey? I mean, I like honey pretty good, and I don't know what locust tastes like, but I'd probably like to have a little, more, little better variety than just those two items in my diet. You see what I mean? But this is who John is. Matter of fact, later we declare of John, that Christ says, who did you think you was looking for when you were looking for John? <laughs> was you looking for somebody dressed in purple and king's clothes and, and, and all? And, no, 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 it's not the man. It's the preaching of John that's important. And John, come, we're introduced to John here as he comes out of the wilderness and, <coughs> and uh, he went out from Jerusalem to, into, uh, all, and all Judea, Judea in verse 5, and all the region round about Jordan. And, and notice this, and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. Here's the important thing. So John baptized, baptized them. But the important part of that verse is they were confessing their sins. They were believing in Christ, putting their faith in Christ, and as a result, they could now be baptized. Here's the thing about it. The preaching of Christ hasn't, hadn't been propagated yet. His public ministry had not began. But Isaiah wrote of it. The same Isaiah that wrote of John also wrote of Christ. And now, as John is teaching, is preaching, repent, the kingdom of heaven is hand, he's preaching this message, repent, repent, turn from your sin, don't just say I'm sorry, but turn from it. Don't do it anymore. Have a desire no longer to engage in it. That's what repentance is. Remember Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26, we talked about a few weeks ago and tried to confuse everybody, you know, that if a man willfully sin or remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. Remember that? That's, that's without repentance. Without repentance, you can't, get, you can't get your sin forgiven because you, didn't, you wasn't really sorry because you really en- planned on engaging in more, uh, more of it. So therefore, you wasn't repentant. So therefore, you didn't turn. So therefore, you, you couldn't get forgiveness. I, I know it doesn't save us, but I want you to think real quickly. Remember the Old Testament sacrifices and how they went forward and, and, and there had to be, there, there was a cost involved. Remember that? The premium livestock had to be given in sacrifice. There was a preparation that had to be made. There had, that animal had to be set apart. It had to be, it had to be looked at. It had to be, it had to be approved of. It had to be set apart. There was a sacrifice of time, a sacri- sacrifice of preparation, a sacrifice financially, and then there was a worship service that took place. There was a time where they recognized who they were sacrificing to. And therefore, they'd done it the way that the Lord wanted it done or it wouldn't have been a pleasing to the Lord. Now, this is important. Wouldn't it be great if we would re- recognize that our Christ, as Isaiah says, is that lamb? He gave himself to be that sacrifice. So because we don't have to go out and find our premium, most expensive piece of livestock of our herd. And because we don't have to set aside, you know, because we don't have to set aside a certain number of days to worship, and we don't have to set aside that animal and watch it and, and make sure it's healthy and, and it's cared for, just, and just because we don't have to do that, we often forget who we're worshiping. And we just want to show up to God casual. Casual in our mind, casual in our thoughts, casual in our behavior. We just think we can just show up and just just worship God because I'm here. That's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. He says, come as you are, but that's to recognize who he is so that you can trust him as your Savior. To recognize you can't change yourself in order to be saved because he died for you just the way you are in your sin. But once you're a child of God, the Bible says you're a child of the King. You're a new creature in Christ. That's exactly right, right, Brother Jack. We should walk differently, behave differently. We should recognize who we're worshiping and who we're serving. We're a child of the king. I said a few days ago, Meghan Markle, the new uh, family member of the queen there in England, she's just recently been released to do some public speaking on her own. You know why? Say, what? 
she's an American girl. She had the, listen, she married into a family of royalty. Therefore, there was a training and a, and a preparation had to be for, because now she represents that family wherever she is. She don't just represent, represent herself, she represents that family. Hey, wait a minute. One of our favorite songs we like to sing is Family of God. When's the last time we actually thought of it that way? That wherever we are, no matter what we do, no matter what we say, we're representing God. We're representing God in our behavior and our actions. Think about that. John comes forth to repre- and preaches a message, repent. <laughs> Confe- and the Bible says in verse 6, and they were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. Verse 7, but when he saw many of the Pharisees, notice this, but when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees, come to his baptism, in other words, he recognized an audience is gathering. Not just the ones that were in the service and hear the preaching of repentance and those that believed and now are being baptized, but now we got a different audience gathering. There are those that are watching that are not believing. You see that? It happens in our life every day. There are those that are watching that's not believing every day. So the Bible says that John noticed this. John took note of the Pharisees gathering over there. He saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees. The Sadducees, by the way, didn't believe in resurrection. That's what, where they were. The Pharisees were the religious law keepers, if you will. And they come to his baptism. He said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? He says, he says, let me ask you a question. Do you believe the preaching of repentance? I'm warning you. Have you heard the warnings before? If you don't turn from what you're believing, you're going to suffer the same wrath as everyone else that's not believed. Just because you're religious doesn't mean that you're saved. Just because you're, you, you have a title doesn't mean that you're secure. Do you believe in repentance? Have you trusted? Have you repented? Notice that. That's powerful. He addresses them, first of all, by who they are. Vipers. All you want to do is bite on everyone else. All you want to do is poison everyone else with your teaching. Now, let me ask you a question, he says. Have you repented? Have you turned? That's a big deal. So he says to them, and in verse 8, bring forth therefore fruits, meat for repentance. I love that. I love that verse. He doesn't mean bring like apples and oranges and bananas and make sure that they're, they're healthy and not brown. And That's not what he means. Catch this real quickly. One of the ways the New Testament tells us that we can examine another person is to look for fruit. So let me ask a question this morning. What fruit are we bearing? What fruit are we bearing? Are we bearing fruit of righteousness, fruit of Christ in us, therefore the righteousness of Christ has been placed in us and we're living our life accordingly to where we're bearing fruit of righteousness? Are we just bearing fruit of flesh? And flu- fruit of sin? What kind of fruit are we bearing with our life? Because... Evidently, these Pharisees and Sadducees were bearing fruit that was not fit for repentance. In other words, their life wasn't lining up with what they were saying. They were saying, oh, we're holy. Oh, we're righteous. Oh, we're good. Oh, we love God. But their life was bearing a different kind of fruit. So John says to them, you vipers, quit poisoning everyone else. Consider repentance. Turn from what you're teaching. Turn from the way you're living. Turn from being a hypocrite. Come to alignment with Christ in your heart and in your life. Repent. And he says, and to prove your repentance, bring forth fruit worthy of repentance. Show me and show others that your life is a life of repentance. I'm afraid sometimes we live our life so casually and carelessly that we forget that our life is bearing fruit. I'm afraid that sometimes people don't see Christ in us because we are not bearing fruit of Christ. They only see us. Now think about that. They only see us. They only see our bitterness like the Pharisees and Sadducees would have. They only see our judgmental spirit. They only see our pride. They only only see our anger. They only see our sinfulness. They only see our behaviors. They only see our religion but not Christ. That's exactly what the Pharisees and Sadducees were. They were religious, but not worthy of repentance. Their life was not bearing forth repentance. 
They wasn't turning from anything. They didn't come there to applaud and congratulate John on what he's doing. John and these New Testament Christians because they were, be, because they were being baptized in their baptism of repentance. Now think about that. He goes on in verse 9. And think not to say within yourselves. This is a powerful. Because he knew who they were. <laughs> this is amazing. Remember, he just come out of the wilderness. Think about this. But the Bible says he was filled with the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. From the day Elizabeth conceived him, he was filled with the Holy Ghost. Think about that. Kind of in a dispensation of his own, wasn't he? The Old Testament, the Holy Ghost came upon him. The New Testament, we're filled with him after we're saved, but, it, but he dwells in us after we're saved. But John was kind of in a dispensation of his own, where he was filled with the Holy Ghost <laughs> from his mother's womb. The only one of his kind. Uniquely equipped for a unique message, for a unique audience, at a unique time to be the pre-runner of Christ, to preach the same message. By the way, the first message that Christ ever preached, the very first message that you read in the text, is repent. <laughs> the same message that John preaches. Think about that. So we now have him, he comes out of the wilderness, and he's now here down, been preaching. People's being saved. Now their father and Lord believers baptism. The Pharisees and the Sadducees hear this. They come and gather along the Jordan, and they're watching what's going on in their heart. They're judging and he says to them, he says, don't you start thinking in your heart because you're Abraham, you're better than us. That's powerful. You ever have anybody say anything to you? You think you're better than me, don't you? You ever have anybody say, say that to you? You ever have anybody say that? Maybe you, because you go to church and they don't, you're asking them to come and join you at church. They say, and, and they start getting angry and bitter and they start saying, you think you're better than me, don't you? You ever have anybody say that to you before? Listen. They're not bearing fruit worthy of repentance. They're refusing to admit that they're a sinner. They only want to judge you or I because we confess that we are. Now think about that. So he says to them, he says, just because you're descendants of Abraham, don't you think that you're better than us? Notice that again. And now, verse 9, And think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father, for I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children of Abraham. It's just because you're a descendant of Abraham doesn't mean that you're better than us. He said, God can make these children, I mean these rocks bear children that be born of Abraham. <laughs> God can do anything. So don't you think that you're better than anybody else because you can trace your lineage back to Abraham. Because you need to repent. That's a powerful message. Because it's not just to the Gentiles, it's to the Jews alike. He says in verse 10, And now also the axe is laid into the root of the trees, therefore lay... Therefore, every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast in the fire. He says, so here, let me ask you a question. He says, what kind of fruit are you bearing? He asked him to start off with, bring forth fruit worthy of repentance. He says, let me warn you, the ax is going to be laid to the tree that's not bearing good fruit. You're going to be cut down. There'll be nothing left. You'll be, you're bearing the wrong fruit, and if you're bearing the wrong fruit, you'll be cut down and cast into the fire. It doesn't matter what you say your lineage is. You need to know who Christ is. Repent, he says. Quit trusting religion, he says. Quit trusting your, re your religious sects and your, 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 your religious cults and quit trusting your, your orthodoxy. He says, repent. Just because you've been titled the, the law keepers, just because you've been titled the, the officers of the law, the Pharisees, and just because you Sadducees, just because you don't believe in, in, in the resurrection of Christ, you don't believe that he's going to be risen from the dead, just because you believe that doesn't mean it's not true. He says you need to turn from your religious teachings and repent. This morning I'm going to ask you a question. If someone were to address us today and we were to walk up to someone and we were to say, hey, I'd like to ask you a question. Do you know if you were to die, you'd have a home in heaven, or, or would you go out and die and go to hell? And they said, well, I think I'd go to heaven. And you said, well, what makes you think you go there? Well, because I think I've done more good than I have bad. And you said, but see, but our works cannot save us. Salvation is by grace through faith, not of works. By grace through faith, that not of yourselves, not of works, as any man should boast. The Bible says that. So you can't, it's not your works. And they say, and, 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 so and then you say, well, so now what makes you think you go to heaven? If you take your works out of the picture, what makes you think you go to heaven? And they might turn and say, what makes you think you're going to heaven? 
think about it. Why are you so sure you're going to heaven? Well, because I've trusted Christ as my Savior. So you're telling me I can live any way I want to live and do anything I want to do and still go to heaven if, as long as I'll just pray and, and pray, ask Christ to be my Savior? And they say, and you say, that's not exactly a true statement. Yes, it is by prayer that you receive Christ. But if you've not had your heart changed where you want different things, then you've not become that new creature. If any man be in Christ, the Bible says, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Say, so therefore, it's not just praying. It's praying and believing. The Bible says, with the mouth confession is made in salvation, and with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. So therefore, you can't just say the words. You have to believe in your heart. John 3, 18, he that believeth is not condemned, but he believeth not is condemned already. You can give him verse after verse after verse. Say, it's believing. It's not just saying the word. It's believing what you say. And they say, so you mean that your life and your works doesn't matter either? And you say, not towards my salvation. And they say, so then how are you living your life? If it doesn't matter if, how you live to determine your salvation, then how are you living your life? You can simply answer this. I'm living my life to please him. Because I love him because he first loved me. Catch this real quickly. Our life should bear fruit worthy of repentance. Our life should be a testimony that we have truly repented and we no longer want to be what we were. We no longer want to live the way we were. We no longer want to be the sinner that we were. That doesn't mean we're perfect. Listen, because they're going to bring it up to us. It, it probably happens to people in this room every week. Somebody brings up something, well, you're not perfect, and you say amen to that. That's good preaching right there. I am not perfect. None of us are. John, or Romans 3.10 and Romans 3.23 applies to me every day. None righteous, no, not one. That's me every day. But I can't tell you this. Because I've trusted Christ as my Savior, the Bible says He has placed His righteousness up on me. So therefore, when you look at my account, it don't say Daryl Rowe. It says Jesus Christ. <laughs> So therefore, I have the blessings, Philippians tells us, that all of heaven can afford in my account. Not the curse of this earth. So as a result of that, I have the righteousness of Christ placed upon me. So therefore, even though I may have some faults still yet because I'm wearing this flesh, this sinful flesh around, one of these days the Bible tells me he's coming back to receive me unto himself and where he is I'll be also in the moment, in the of eye, he's going to change me and give me a glorified body. So one of these days, this body is going to be changed. So yes, you may see some things that's not perfect about me. But with the Lord's help, I'm trying to please him with my life. And can I say this real quickly? We can argue that all along with our mouth, but they won't believe our words near as much as they'll believe our actions. So here's a thought this morning, and we'll, and we'll conclude. If John were to walk into this church today and say, Repent! And he declared for us, and, and someone stood up and said, Maybe I would. May I say, John, what are you talking about? We're a church. He said, don't, don't, you, don't you tell me that. He says, Because your works should be worthy of repentance. And if your works are not worthy of repentance, if they haven't shown that you've been repentant in your heart, then your works, that tree that's going to bear that fruit of works, is just going to be cut off and cast into the fire. And he might say, so let me ask you a question. Do you want to be cast into the fire? Think about that. So today, how are you living your life? Are you living your life to bear fruits worthy of repentance? If you've trusted Christ your Savior and been baptized, when you were baptized, did you bear forth a testimony that you trusted Christ by public being, being baptized, by immersion, by, be, by symbolizing the death, by the holding of your breath, by symbolizing the burial, by the going under the water, by a resurrecting and beginning to take a new breath, by coming up out of the water, I mean, taking, beginning to breathe again, representing the, the 
and the resurrection of Christ from the tomb, victory over death, hell, and the grave? Have you been scripturally baptized because you were repentant and believed? Or do you do it in hopes that that would bring repentance and salvation? And then not only that, have you been baptized even though it may have been after you said with your lips, I'm saved, but your life has not been bearing forth the fruit worthy of repentance. One of the amazing things that we can do with our life is we can be a witness of Christ in a very sinful world. Or we cannot be a witness of Christ to a very sinful world. And God says, I'm giving you a free will. Don't use it as a stumbling block to the weak. Let your life bear forth fruit that tells forth the story of repentance in your life. Let your life be a life that bears fruit, that tells of the repentance that's already took place in your heart. I know. I live in the same world you do. I face the same difficulties you do. And I, I, know, I know how easy it is to get frustrated, aggravated, mad, and lose it for a minute. I know. So therefore, I want to run right back to, the, to God on the throne of grace. Say, Lord, forgive me where I failed you. Forgive me, Lord, for not testifying of you by my life like I should. Lord, I want to bear forth good fruit, worthy of repentance. Lord, I know it's not my works that save me, but because you saved me, I want to bear forth fruit. You grafted me into your very vine, and therefore, Lord, I want to bear forth the fruit of Christ in my life. Forgive me where I failed you. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed this morning, what is it in